Bonjour tout le monde. Let's start everybody. It's already uh okay. Bravo. A bit of music. Um good morning everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, session. We have two parallel sessions. This is the session on recovering Europe's global influence. Nothing easier than that. So that's our task we have today to define how Europe can, should, could uh, recover its global influence. Um, we have uh, a panel here of people with a very diverse background, which I think will make this debate lively. And we will strive to... Uh, get your participation as early on as possible. Um, I will briefly introduce uh, the two co-chairs. This is uh, Pascal Lamy. I think he doesn't need any further introduction. Myself, I'm Franziska Brandner. I'm a member of the German Bundestag, and we're happy to host this panel. Um, in the booklet you all have, there were some questions given in terms of... Um, what should be the EU's priority of um, maybe setting an international agenda for global governance, nothing easier than that, or re-establishing Europe's leadership on climate change and sustainable development, updating trade and development links with key Asian, African and Latin American nations. But we will take these questions a bit more broadly um, and try really to say what could it be uh, that could help recover Europe's global influence. Um, we have three panelists that will give us their view on how this could be achieved and if it should be achievable. Um, and uh, I introduced them very briefly. We have, I have on my left Asiya Ben Salah Aloui, who is uh, ambassador at large uh, for the King of Morocco. And she, to many probably in the room, she's also known as an activist on women's education, at least to me she was known as that. Um, and um, she's also one of those active on trying to foster Euro-Mediterranean dialogue. Um, so we are happy to have you here. Um, even if that wasn't necessarily mentioned in the questions, your region is of course key uh, to what Europe can and should do. Um, to my right, we have Monsieur Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, who is uh, with uh, Solve, uh, the um, big Belgium success story. <laughs> um, and you were originally with Rodia, um, before joining Solvay, and there you were uh, working especially with a focus on Latin America. Um, so you can cover that, that region, but also questions about um, if the EU can actually be still a leader in sustainable development, as we cannot do this without the companies actually doing that, um, div uh, di that change. And last but not least, I have Christian Leffler on the right, um, who has a new job now, who is Deputy <coughs> Secretary General for Economic and Global Issues in the European External Action Service. Congratulations again for that new post. Um, as many of you might know, he has been working on almost all regions of this world, be it in the Commission or in the External Action Service. 
um, Latin America, um, Americas in general. Um, and we're happy to have you here in your new role and looking forward to hear from you. We will start with uh, Mr. Clamadieu. I give you the floor. We have uh, five minutes sharp and we will watch the time. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll try to do my best. So, uh, indeed, I'm the CEO of Solvay. So, Solvay, I tend to present Solvay as a European uh, company. I mean, when I say European, we are very global in our business, but indeed, uh, uh, Europe is really where our um, it's really where we were born and it's really the region uh, that has influenced very much the culture of uh, the culture of Solvay. Maybe just a few words first to say that um, I guess I'm the voice of business in this panel and business sometimes is critical about Europe. We tend to focus on the, uh, on the frustration that we have here and there, but it's very important sometimes to say that we and especially large companies are strong supporters of the European project. I think when, I, uh, when you manage a global company, uh, it's very difficult to think of going back and developing a French, German, Belgium strategy. The fact that we have a united Europe is something which for us is extremely important. And then, yes, we can develop a North American strategy, an Asian strategy, and a European strategy. So we are, by definition, I think, strong supporter of a European project. Uh, second comment, we've seen a number of very large companies starting in Europe and becoming global leaders. We all have a lot of names in our head. And I think that we suffer uh, from time to time from the lack of influence of Europe. Uh, when we go in countries where flags are important, China, Russia, uh, we tend to continue to go behind our national flags. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to think of circumstances where a CEO would go with a representative of the EU to visit, the, um, to visit policy makers uh, in these countries. And uh, as, uh, as far as survey is concerned, surprisingly, it's probably more powerful to go to China with the king of Belgium or the French president than with a representative of the, um, of the EU. And I think that it's really something in a world where we see a lot of challenges from the uh, Joe's strategic standpoint, it's a bit of a frustration to see that these very large and very strong European companies don't get the support of EU as our American counterpart would get the support of the, um, of the American uh, government, not to mention the Chinese, which really goes hand in hand with their uh, own government. Third point, I'm going to one of the questions that, uh, that you've raised. There are areas where Europe clearly took a leadership position. Climate change is a very good example. Uh, Europe decided after the, uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, uh, signing or within the Kyoto Protocol to take a leadership position as far as climate change is concerned, but we've not been very good uh, at becoming the real driving force of a real global agreement on climate change. When you look at how the COP21 is currently being prepared, we see much more focus given on what the, uh, Ameri the US president or the Chinese presidents are doing together than we do about Europe. Europe started uh, uh, in the preparation of this, uh, of this COP by putting its proposal on the table. By the way, very uh, ambitious proposal. Uh, Europe was the only region coming with a very strong track record. Indeed, we have achieved what we've uh, committed to in the Kyoto Protocol, and we are the only regions of the world who have achieved this. And yet, we are not at the center stage of the negotiation. And I think this is a disappointment. I remember uh, a meeting of uh, CEOs of large companies with uh, uh, President Barroso six or seven years ago, telling us, you are very lucky because Europe is leading the race on the fight against climate change. And this will force you to get ready, and then you will have an advantage uh, in the global scene. Frankly speaking, sometimes I feel that Europe is not leading the race. Europe is running alone, and that's a bit uh, of a disappointment. And on top of that, Europe is not very good at doing its own marketing. I don't think that Europe has had, has had the ability in the past few years to explain, to market what we've been doing in terms of uh, climate change. And again, it's a disappointment because we have achieved a lot. And I think we should be in a position to be in the center of the stage and making sure that we create some convergence between, um, 
uh, between the large uh, economies, and this is not the case. Uh, this is not the case today. Another example, a bit more technical but important for chemists, as far as uh, product stewardship is concerned, we have developed a piece of regulation, rich in Europe, which is very far-reaching, very ambitious. Currently, in US and in China, similar regulations are being developed. Frankly speaking, rich is not on the center of the discussion, neither in North America nor in China. It means that Europe has not been able in this area to, to market what it has uh, done and to, make, to create a situation where what we've been able to achieve collectively would be a reference for other uh, similar regulation in other parts of the world. So I guess my five minutes are, have expired, but my only message uh, to, to conclude is that I think that a strong or a stronger and more influential Europe would be very important to support the development and the competitiveness of European-led uh, or European-headquartered companies. And I think it's really something where we and the various policy makers or stakeholders who are in this room could work together. Thank you. Um, Madame Ambassadrice, from your point of view, what would you expect the EU to do or to be for your region, for your country, when you say leadership, is it actually something you want? If yes, what kind of leadership, what would be necessary for it? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I had misunderstood, you know, the... Uh, labeling of the questions of this session and I thought that the Mediterranean was outside and I really wanted to thank the Europeans for this sense of humor because uh, <laughs> to include me in a session about global influence um, that was really something and the question raised by the title is many actually because I should ask why Europe should care about its global influence when uncontrolled territories, turmoil and chaos are at its doorsteps and uh, is threatening its own premises. So the priority for me, of course, would be the Mediterranean and the region and how it should go about it. Is it able to go about it alone? This is the question and seek a global influence. And this, if you allow me, I would like very briefly address the questions I thought I had to address before coming very quickly to this. <laughs> Uh, simply to ask the uh, question, why should Europe seek to recover global influence now? At a moment, it is morally, and I could add physically, assaulted by urgent questions. So it seems to me that it has neither the uh, time in a very overloaded agenda, nor the required cohesion within divided Europe and rift among Atlantic, transatlantic allies, nor the financial means to contemplate pursuing such goals whose probably payoff in terms of influence would be at best deferred and at worst totally aléatoire. So how could it pursue it alone? It's simply uh, at a moment where we do think, and a lot of observers uh, conquered to say that like-minded governments, and especially Europeans and Americans, have to pull all their resources together to address the magnitude and the complexity of the challenges. So, of course, the short answers to the first and the third would be almost mission impossible proposals that you have been making. Because, uh, as you know, you know uh, reform of the global governance has been for decades on the table, and its legitimacy is unquestioned, but as well the inability of the international community to address it. And we see why the Europeans, how could they advocate for more votes, more say, to the emerging powers at the moment the US Congress is blocking totally any attempt of reform. At a moment where you have the BRICS creating at the Fortaleza uh, summit their own counter institutions in the name of the World Bank and uh, to counter the IMF where let's uh, everybody knows it but let's re remind it where the second largest economy in the world China has less votes in the IMF than the Benelux so and what is ironic as well is that we see very clearly that uh, 
uh, even the UK is trying to use the facilities and it has been very much criticized for that by the, by the Americans because for its stance towards China. This is a very conflictual issue. What stands to have towards China? And if you have read, like most, you know, the financial time of yesterday, you know a lot about this problem, how to upgrade trade, investment, and so forth with the key emerging nations and still not totally uh, have divergent positions within the Western uh, uh, problems. Uh, as you said, I think that uh, the second proposal about um, climate change and uh, sustainable development is probably the most prominent issue where Europe could make a difference. But still, you have three big questions. The, the time, it requires a lot of time and energy and of negotiations lengthy. The time frame is long payoff versus a very, very uh, uh, excited Europe for immediate solutions and even democracies. And as well, financial means again, because you were mentioning the LDCs and the developing world at large. Who is going to pay for the other costs in order to have this driving and convincing uh, force to do that? And very briefly to say a word about the Mediterranean, but we could probably raise this in, in the discussion, is that it is to uh, face the challenges in the Mediterranean and Middle East and beyond the periphery and Africa, which is the rising continent and probably a hope for Europe's development, really requires a new, totally innovative approach. Everybody speaks of innovative approach, but what we have been seeing is cosmetic lifting of a decade-old policy, which is the ENP. So we'll be waiting for the 18th of November to have you know, the answer of the refoundation of the ENP. Actually, Morocco has been very, very proactive in making quite a few proposals even to consider Africa and the Atlantic um, border you know, within this framework. But would it be capable alone to address the magnitude of this? It seems to me that uh, Europe has the obligation to uh, count on some positive partners who can be, uh, of course, I'm advocating for my country. Why? Because it is developing a comprehensive global strategy against and to combat the rising complexity of the security environment, including the counter narration for preventing the extremism, where you have a mix from reshuffling, reforming the religious field to economic and development and human development issues and, of course, the revamping of security approach. But the big challenge that Morocco is facing, how to do that within the respect of law and the promotion of democracy and the, to keep it within. So perhaps in the discussions I could come back to that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. The difference between business people and diplomats is that business people, for them, it's easier to vent their frustrations. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> diplomats have to be sort of, you know, a bit more nice, a bit more polite. But let's be frank, what we've heard so far is quite a lot about disappointment and, and frustration. And I don't think this is surprising. Uh, for a long time, and those of us who are very old uh, remember that, the view was that Europe was a, an economic giant and a political dwarf. But that with time, the dwarf would grow. Uh, what's happened is the other way around. The economic giant is shrinking, and uh, the dwarf has created a terrible mess in what matters most for European influence, which is Europeans' neighborhood. When you look at Northern Africa, uh, Middle East, Russia, Ukraine, it's a mess. So, not surprising that in these conditions there is frustration and disappointment. And the question for uh, Christian Leffler, who's speaking for the European institutions, and the Commission, in my view, remains 
the open institution number one. I'm from the old school on that. Uh, the, question, the question for Christian is, how is it that all this has happened or not happened, and how does the Commission intend to cope with that? Right. Thank you, Pascal. That's, um, um, <laughs> how long have we got? No. <laughs> Um, five minutes, no. So now, af after the frustration of the businessman and the polished criticism of the diplomat, uh, you get the blunt bureaucrat. Um, I would say, the, the, uh, coming to your question, well, we're certainly dwarfed by some of the challenges around us, but so is everyone. Um, I wouldn't say that it's the dwarf who's broken all the toys in the playroom. They weren't asked to play with him to, be, to begin with. Um, and I'd like, in that sense also, to, to come to the title of this panel, uh, Recovering European Influence um, in This Asian Century. In a sense, I disagree with both, at least to challenge discussion here. Um, if you talk about recovering influence, it means you've lost it. Um, there's certainly been a redistribution, but I'd like to see it more in terms of sharing and welcoming actors who have emerged or who have re-emerged on the international stage, reaching out and seeing how we can work together in new configurations. Um, and this Asian century, uh, we salute the dynamism of many of the countries across Asia. But I also hear regularly uh, in other seminars or read articles about the dynamic emergence of Africa. Or I witnessed over the past five years as head of the America's department in the External Action Service, uh, the amazing progress made in Latin America. So we can make it um, a multipolar century. And that's quite good. That's excellent. And that comes to the point of looking for our right partners. Um, I'd say as an aside, the, the European Union likes giving labels to things. And one of the labels we've used over the past 10 years or so now is strategic partners. Nobody really knows what it means. Uh, and we give it, we give it to a lot of countries ranging from the United States to Russia. I probably don't need to say more than that. Uh, or China to South Africa, which are a pretty motley crowd. My definition of it is you can't define a strategic partner in the abstract, but you recognize one when you see one. And that comes to the point of finding the constructive partners. Now, how can we be a constructive partner and how can we that way reassert our power and influence around the world? We can do it by consolidating the progress we've made economically, but also politically and institutionally by being more cohesive than we can, by trying to encourage or beat up our member states, by pursuing uh, what we're good at and trying to get better as we've not been so good at. Um, I would like to believe that one of the areas we're quite good at is the economy. It's trade, it's investment, it's economic integration, it's economic, even economic reform. Um, we've had challenges, we still do, but we have made um, uh, significant progress on it. Um, we're traditionally not very good at the hard foreign policy agenda. Um, we don't like sticks because they break. And we have bad experience from the first half of the 20th century of breaking sticks. So we've tried to use carrots instead. Nevertheless, in the hard agenda, uh, don't forget, for example, the European lead of the so-called 3 plus 3 negotiations with Iran. Um, a hugely important political issue on the international stage, uh, where through European leadership, European facilitation, um, a solution has been found which we hope will now stick. More importantly, the softer agenda and the global issues agenda. Climate change has been mentioned. Uh, the um, 
new sustainable development goals where Europe played a very strong leadership role in the negotiations in New York in widening those to um, more than a narrow traditional development agenda, also widening the application to say, this will now apply to all of us. The first task after New York last month for the EU, and the Commission is working on it, is to develop an agenda for the implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda within the EU. And based on that, we will then be in a better position to talk to our partners around the world how to apply it elsewhere in the world. On the trade and investment front, um, our strong belief in working on market openings and cooperative market openings, despite the economic crisis over the last 10 years, Europe has not turned inward. Europe has not turned protectionist. We've looked for new trading opportunities. Despite the economic crisis, European development assistance has gone up. It's not gone down. So we remain in that area too, a huge partner. We're very welcome, we're very happy to welcome other partners. If we could make development an Asian century too, fine, have them contribute. Um, last point, um, and I, one that is maybe a little bit unfashionable, but which I think is important to mention when you talk of Europe in the world, is the normative agenda. Uh, Europe is or at least I would like to believe, it is a community of values. It is built on a set of values and principles that we hold very dear, to do with how society should be organized, to do with the respect for the individual down to fundamental rights, to do with the rule of law. All of those do give us a position, sometimes an awkward one, but nevertheless an important position in the world. And these days, when we are facing a new challenge with a massive immigration um, to Europe, um, massive at least by European standards. One thing I think we should bear in mind or even be perversely proud of is these people want to come to Europe. They're not knocking at anybody else's door. There's a reason for that. They like our values. Um, Mr. Leffler just said that the EU is still good at you know, economy and trade. Would you agree or would, would you rather agree with here that this is also shrinking and uh, what would... No, I, I think uh, Europe clearly is, uh, is good at economy when we see the development of some of the uh, large European corporations. That's, uh, that's a reality. Now we see uh, challenges coming from other regions. And if I just take the example of my industry, sorry to, sorry to bore you a little bit with chemicals, but... Uh, uh, ten years ago, our market share in the global uh, chemical um, markets were uh, 33%, if my memory is correct. We are down uh, today at 13%. So part of it is really the development of other regions, but part of it is also a loss of competitiveness. And uh, I think it's very important that we keep in mind that indeed we need to make sure that we defend the competitiveness of, this, of our production base. Uh, I'm not a guy, it's probably because of my... Uh, activity, but I don't believe that uh, Europe could be indeed a strong economic power without, without strong basic industries. Uh, if you take a simple example of, uh, of chemistry, we are at the beginning of a lot of different supply chain. If, if we want to continue to be leaders in automotive industry, we need the technologies that the chemical industry is producing. So the, the fact we are still important, but we are losing a bit of ground, we are losing a bit of competitiveness, and this is clearly something we should be uh, attentive to. Thank you. And uh, if I may re uh, ask you one question, because you were criticizing the review of the neighborhood policy and saying it looks like cosmetic lifts. If you could, you know, craft it, what would you make different? Well, I think that the whole approach is really, um, is dated and everybody agrees about that. The only problem is that the processes of the European Union are so heavy and so much time consuming to reconcile that even when you come with strong proposals, as Morocco has been intending to do in our uh, non-paper of May, with some very strong proposals, afterwards, unfortunately, they are watered down and you get, you know, really not... Uh, what your was your own. proposal in May? Maybe not everybody knows. Well, it. we have made a quite, you know, long list of, from principles to concrete issues, 
saying that we really have, you know, that Europe has to take into consideration the concerns of the partners, including the digestion of la qui communautaire, which is so heavy for Europeans themselves, so let alone, you know, for developing countries, and as well to, to consider uh, better sharing some concrete issues and better access to a European market. It is happening, but very slow, and you have a sort of inadequacy in the timing between the urgent and pressing needs around the south of Europe and the time of the European answer. And this is a real problem. I don't know how you are going to mend it. I don't know how it can answer you know, this problem. Uh, and second, probably uh, you should be uh, there is a lot of discussion about LDCs and about, you know, medium uh, powers and so forth. I think that it is important not to disregard the countries which are trying their best to do better. And we do fall in this category. So, and sometimes because we are progressing, because we are opening, because people are being much harsher and much more demanding, so it is sometimes difficult to give to your own population much more than they can digest whether be it in the problematic of human rights and whatever, because this is a real, real issue that we are trying, you know, to address very clearly. But unfortunately now it is being overlooked because of the urgency of the security consideration and the chaos which is at the door, not only of North Africa, but much further as well in the Sahel and in the whole Atlantic um, Africa. African rim. Another thing that uh, we do need, you know, to, to get from the European Union is some clear stand on how to back policies which can encourage the opening towards <coughs> Africa. And this is, I think, absolutely basic because, as you know, the uh, bilateral uh, relations between European nations and Africa are getting loosened. It's losing ground. So how can European Union as such replace or regain ground where its member states are losing ground very obviously and where China is doing the infrastructure. It is very much criticized but it's doing the job. This is the drama and that's what you know the Africans as well you know need to, to consider. Um, uh, Christian, b before we give uh, the floor uh, to this room, uh, let me try and keep uh, the Commission a bit under pressure. Uh, what we've heard from you, Christian, is a, a sort of traditional uh, view that where, I mean, don't ask too much on tough security strategic issues. This is not our turf. Hard things are for member states. But we are good at uh, geoeconomics. That's where we have a comparative advantage. And geoeconomics is about trade, it's about development, uh, it's about environment. Now, on trade, the most recent uh, outcome is that uh, German public opinion has turned against the transatlantic uh, partnership. Not that a great score. On environment, what we've heard from uh, <coughs> Mr. Clamadieu is that uh, Europe is behaving like a good Boy Scout, uh, why uh, US and China are cooking the pot. What we've heard about development uh, is that uh, it doesn't really work. We still provide a lot of official development assistance, but at a time where private finance is uh, the key for infrastructures, which is the real issue about development. So even on this, let's say the score is mixed. So. What's, what's, your, what's your take on that, Christian? Um, well, clearly, if you want to see us as good Boy Scouts, fine. Um, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Um, you wouldn't expect me to. I think, um, firstly, maybe coming back to be more, uh, more clear on uh, sort of soft power, hard power, etc. Um, it's not the hard power side is developing and is developing more than most people realize. Um, I haven't got the exact figures in my head for the moment but I think that f at this time in 
I think it's 12 field missions in different parts of the world, many of them in Africa. The EU deploys 20,000 people, soldiers uh, and civilians in different crises in different parts of Africa. Over the past five years, we've had almost 100,000 Europeans, if you accumulate them and how they rotated. That's quite a lot of people. Um, and hopefully they are contributing to stability and security in the areas where they're involved. But we complement that with a lot of other activities. Um, do you say um, the African infrastructure is now being built by China? Some of it is, and that's great. We've never pretended we want to build all the infrastructure. In fact, we don't necessarily think that's the best use of European money because that's not where we are um, most competitive. Pouring concrete or pouring tarmac um, is not something you need a European high-tech company to do or European contractors. So if we can share the burden, great. But I also suspect that there are many parts of Africa where neither China nor other outsiders are particularly interested because it doesn't look like a very profitable venture, but it may be hugely important for the long-term socio-economic development of that particular country or that particular region. That's where we come in as the real suckers we are, but we think that it's actually good for the continent in the long term. And what's good for the continent in the long term is also good for us. It creates uh, more dynamic societies, it creates markets, it creates futures for people at home so that they don't have to go and look for it somewhere else, be it in other countries in Africa or across the waters in Europe. So all of that comes together. Um, is Europe a sufficiently strong economic power? Obviously we'd like to be stronger and we're trying to work on it. Um, but and do we need strong basic industries for it? Yes, we do need strong basic industries and we're proud to have many of them. But the strength in those industries, in our vision, lies in their competitiveness, not in their protection. And that is fundamental, and I think that's why I mentioned before, throughout the years of economic crisis, Europe did not turn inwards. There were no conclusions from a council or from a European council to say, we're gonna close our borders because we're going to look after ourselves. No, the solution was to be found in more outreach, more cooperation, and therefore also economically greater competitiveness. We do have, these days, uh, a big problem, another big problem of communication. We generally have problems of communication. We've always um, managed that somehow. Um, the issues we see around TTIP, we could have a whole other session on. It seems that TTIP somehow has become the fulcrum for everything that's wrong in society. Big government against small people, big business against small business, globalization and all its ills. If the weather turns sour, it's probably the fault of TTIP too. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's become uh, very difficult to argue a case um, for an agreement uh, which from a normative point of view, should be fairly self-evident in terms of its potential advantages as long as we stick to our fundamental principles, values and objectives. Um, that will be a challenge. We hope that as the negotiations progress, as um, there is more public debate, uh, one can also bring that onto a more level footing and therefore make the debate uh, a little bit more balanced. Um, that will take time, uh, but we're usually a quite patient lot, so I think we'll get there. Coming from a member state where you have this TTIP debate, I can tell you that what I felt in a lot of debates we had on TTIP is the lack of trust that the EU Commission will stick to these values. And that's the basic problem we have, um, that they don't trust you will not sell out these values. And that really, it's not about the many of you know people that I know who are themselves transatlanticists. It, it's not about having a, tra a trade partnership, but it's the trust in you not to give up these values. Um, and there, I think it's a much more fundamental problem than just TTIP. Um, if you like, just yeah. one comment on that, and I, I, I agree with that, and I think uh, a mistake made by the EU as EU, by our member states, and by the Americans. 
is treating TTIP as a free trade negotiation. It's not. It's a lot more than that. And Pascal knows well, uh, traditionally, uh, on free trade negotiations, there was a kind of silent compromise between the public and the negotiators. Give us a mandate, then leave us alone. We'll go into the closed doors, smoke-filled rooms, we'll come out with a deal, you look at it, if it's good enough, you take it. And generally, they took it. But TTIP is different, because TTIP is not about that. There is already such a large measure of free trade in traditional tariff terms between the US and the EU. That's not the important issue. The important issue here is the regulatory challenge and the potential benefits from it. But that means you have to um, engage in a totally different matter and you have to reach out, you have to talk, you have to listen, you have to discuss. Uh, and I fully agree, that's the challenge, that's where we need to work uh, in order to uh, show what the benefits are, then people make up their mind. Thank you. I have a question from the left. You were the first to raise your hand, yes. I don't know how it works. To... I take a few, yes. I will collect a few. And introduce yourself briefly, if possible, and uh, okay. make it brief. Um, Suad McKennett, uh, I'm a journalist, and uh, I actually, you know, given the topic of this discussion, um, um, I, I'm wondering, and I'm actually still su so surprised after exper the experiences of the last couple of years uh, and the outcome of the so-called Arab Spring. I mean, if we look at what's happening in Syria, we just discussed the whole question of refugees, now Libya, of course, and, and other places. You know, it's very interesting for me to see that until today, I don't see a long-term strategy of European foreign policy. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, if it comes to the Middle East, if it comes to North Africa, or even if we talk about security, I don't see any long-term strategy. And um, it's interesting when we talk about the things, the achievements of Europe, and uh, the Iran nuclear deal was just mentioned. Here is, here is a, another narrative, uh, which is the one that ISIS is using in order to recruit people. Um, by showing pictures in some of their password protected uh, websites on forums where they exactly show Europeans or Westerners sitting around the table with the Iranians and, uh, you know, have negotiated this nuclear deal. But who was not sitting there? You don't see any Arab countries who attended the meetings. They were left out. These, the nuclear deal was achieved by, uh, of course, uh, you know, the Europeans or the Americans. But this is exactly the problem, you know, when, when we don't think long term because they are saying the narrative is um, here again, the West is trying to hand over more power, powers uh, to, to, to Shia militias, to, uh, this is their narrative, not mine, or to Iranians. Um, and given the um, examples of 2003, what happened in Iraq, and the situation in Iraq right now, this is a very big recruiting tool. So my question is, why are there not long-term strategies? Why is it that... Uh, for, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, there's just a short-term thinking and people are selling it as a, a big win-win situation. And my, one last comment. Um, yes, the, uh, if I may say, as I mentioned earlier, I've covered the refugee situation for the last four weeks now. And you all respect a lot of these people are not coming because they like European values. It is just really things like um, um, uh, having better health care, maybe having a better social system, it, so financial support, okay. these but, the but these are not <laughs> European. I'm sorry, these are not, if you talk about other European values, these are very strict financial or economic values. And I think it's very important that these things have to be addressed and really named by name. Thank you. Thank you. Our social security is sort of standing for some values, at least I believe so. But uh, you have the next question. Am I heard? Yes. Uh, well, it is natural that we Europeans want to, want to raise our international profile. It is absolutely natural. And two themes uh, compete in my mind. The first is climate change, and the second is global governance. Now, with climate change, the advantage is that it is better for soft power and image. But practically, I don't think that Europe can do much on climate change because problems 
are elsewhere, Asia and America. It is time consuming, as uh, Ambassador Alawi has said, long uh, time horizon and lots of, lots of funds are required. With global governance, things are different because the global economy is now facing enormous problems of adjustments, the <clears throat> restructuring, the rebalancing between uh, U USA and China, the role of the, the dollar versus the emerging power of, of the renminbi, and the anchor of the future monetary system, the restructuring of global institutions, the crazy system of voting rights in the AMF, the excessive Americanness of World Bank, which has invited China to create its own World Bank, and finally, policy coordination issues, austerity, monetary easing, structural reforms at a global scale. However, there is also a snag in the role that uh, Europe can play in global governments. To be convincing and be able to teach others, it should put its own house in order. So long as the Eurozone is a lagging, is a laggard in the world economy and is a the ill person in the global economy, I don't think that Europe, unfortunately, has much to say on global government. So what could ideally one and uh, hopefully see is a parallel effort of improving the Eurozone and also suggesting an agenda for the global economy. That could be the agenda for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Céline Chavez from Oxfam. I, I just come from Bonn. Um, just one comment on, on European strategy on climate change. I think it is driven by fear, mostly. Uh, if you talk to people close to the negotiations, they say our main fear is not to be at the table in the final hours of Paris. A strategy driven by fear is never successful. But my question goes to uh, Mr. Leffler. Um, you said it was really important for uh, our... Uh, global influence to stick to our values. So I'd like to know why it is that the European Union is sometimes cons conspicuously silent when civil society is being shut down in many developing countries. We're seeing a raft of new legislation across the South that are actually threatening the very existence of civil society. And I'm not here talking about Oxfam, I'm talking about domestic civil society that is so important to governance in those countries and why the European Union was silent yesterday when Japan uh, threw out uh, civil society from the negotiating rooms in Bonn, because clearly it is because of civil society that governments cannot come to an agreement on climate change. Thank you. Thank you. I go over to the side of the room. Mr. Uh, uh, John Richardson from the German Marshall Fund. Um, I do understand that, uh, that Europe should be engaged globally in, in areas where the world economy is concerned. Same thing with climate change. But in terms of its diplomatic efforts, I wonder when we, uh, whether we haven't um, seen, and, uh, and this has been said by the panel already, that we really should be concentrating on our neighborhood where we have much clearer interests than in, in the rest of the world. Pascal spent a very considerable part of his time and effort once on ensuring that we didn't turn economically into a fortress Europe and coined the term world, Europe world partner at the time. It does seem to me we're faced with a similar challenge now, not turning Europe into a migration fortress, but a place which has partnerships with all the countries around its, its uh, periphery. And that's where the weight of resources, particularly diplomatic, but also financial, should be concentrated. In other words, our eastern periphery the Mediterranean, but also probably the Sahel region as well. And that's a reorientation of a lot of the resources that we need. But one final comment, I want to agree with Christian about the influence of our values around the world. I found this in working for many years on external relations. Uh, large parts of Latin America, large parts of Southeast Asia have spent decades full of admiration for the European model and trying to get as close to it as they, as they possibly could. If we want that to continue to be the case and that influence to continue, we will need to make sure that we maintain our values inside the EU in the face of financial and migration crises now. Thank you. And one final one there, and then we go back to this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Bruno Tobak from Belgian Parliament. Um, I was very, I, was, I had a great difficulty choosing between which of the two sessions to attend because I think they very much overlap in what they aim. If you want to have global influence, 
you have to first be aware of what you are standing for, what the values are, and have a public that trusts them. And we are in Europe, we are very bad at that. Um, basically, the European Union and European Commission and TTIP is in part a, a symptom of that. It's, about, it's always been about doing business with the world and never about imposing our values on the world, which is what Chinese and Americans very obviously do. Um, to give another example, which is a very painful one, we all have constructed in the European Union economies that are based on relatively high fiscal burdens um, in order to be able to construct a society where middle class exists. But it was not until the, Euro the United States in the aftermath of, uh, of terrorist attempts uh, imposed this that we really went for such a thing as fiscal transparency that we were able to do something about the situation with Switzerland and Luxembourg, even within the European Union. We are very bad at defining what our values are and what our aims are beyond just doing business with the rest of the world. But that means that you always put yourself in a losing position, in a begging position, in a begging position for access to this market, while the rest of the world has been trying for decades indeed to become more like European society and people still come here because they want to be like Europe, a lot of European governments and austerity is another symptom of that are moving towards being like China. I find this very puzzling. Thanks. One more on this side. Down. Yeah. Sergio Arzeni, just retired from the uh, OECD. Um, do you really believe that um, ultimately Europe could gain global influence without having a common seat in the, U in the UN Security Council and without a serious military capacity? Okay, we've, we've had this first uh, wave of uh, uh, questions. Uh, I think we now could go back to, 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 the, to the panel. This issue of uh, there is not something like a long-term strategy, which, by the way, we already heard in the opening session, so it must be something that, uh, that is out there. Uh, this suggestion that we should uh, refocus on what matters most, which is the periphery, including Sahel, if I uh, understood the question uh, well. This issue with values, after all, is this not our sort of best uh, export uh, uh, we, we can have. Uh, all this leads to you know, sort of one question, which I think for Mr. Reclamadieu and for the ambassador would be again, what would you expect to change so that according to what matters for you in the chemical business or as a, as a, a Moroccan ambassador, what what would you wish the EU to do that it doesn't do? And then maybe uh, for Christian, uh, which I think has uh, reasonably well uh, fenced off my push. Well done, uh, well done, Christian. The Commission is still alive and, alive and punching. Well done. Uh, what would you leave your hat aside? What would you wish the priority to be? If I, if I may, Pascal, maybe just a, a comment on what you've said, Christian. Uh, clearly, I share your view that the key issue is competitiveness. And uh, a very uh, important achievement of the past few years, as you said, is that we have not answered to the crisis by protectionism. That's, uh, that's something which is very strong. And I think that, uh, indeed, large corporations, maybe some of the smaller ones are in a different, uh, have different views, but large corporations support uh, the uh, free trade. I mean, we don't want Europe to become uh, a fortress. That's, uh, that's clear. But we want competitiveness and we want to move in the direction of a level playing field. And when we look at uh, what we want to achieve uh, regarding norms within TTIP, or when we look at climate change, a lot of this is about creating a level playing field and creating some convergence. What do we expect or what would you like to see being done differently? Uh, frankly speaking, a stronger role for Europe. I think member states are still uh, doing too much. I mean, if you think of the, uh, of the negotiation uh, on the COP, I think I would like to see a European commissioner coming at the table with the cards in hand to be a participant in the negotiation. This is not the case today. I mean, uh, member states are 
tying up the hands of Europe, and it makes it very difficult. I mean, it's clear that the, uh, the European Commissioner is not in a position to, in the same position as his uh, counterpart in the US or in, uh, in China when it comes to making a deal. You are talking about sustainable development goals that were approved in uh, by the UN in New York a few weeks ago. I was there, and it was clear that there was a strong Europe Uh, but I see today on this issue of sustainable development a lot of initiatives at the member state level which should be taken at the European level. There is currently a, a strange piece of legislation in France which is going through the Parliament to create a different approach to sustainable development. It should be dealt with at the European level. So, frankly speaking, what I would like is very simple, more Europe. Well, I'm going to say a paradox. We do need a strong Europe to be real partners because it is not treating us as partners and it has to be more self-confident, more credible. And what we are expecting from Europe, it has been said about the long-term strategy and the response to the Arab Spring was extremely disappointing to this fresh wind of liberty and freedom. Too late, too little. What we are expecting from Europe is even more. We are expecting exemplarity. We are really tired of being labeled. And when we look at the behaviors, we look at the double standards within Europe and the way some European uh, countries behave towards their own citizens who are from Arab descent, it's really disappointing and it is not attractive for us to follow, you know, this path. So exemplarity is really what we need, you know, from Europe. It's difficult, I understand, to be faithful to your values and still adapt swiftly to a very rapidly changing world and a very challenging world where you have sometimes to have very difficult trade-off between security, trade, and to be committed to your own values and principles. But still, that's why we are looking for Europe for the example. And our students, I can tell you as professor of international law at the university, are extremely, and they are resenting all the West for that. They say, do what we say and don't do what we do. And that's why it's very difficult. We don't have a model, you know, for building democracy. We have very different issues. So we still require this exemplarity when, you know, Europe speaks. And this consistency, unfortunately, is very, very much lacking in the approach. So. All right. Um, the, what I hear here is more Europe and more consistent Europe or more coherent Europe. It's nice. Usually it's up to whoever comes from the institutions to try to plead for more Europe. So thank you for that. That's, um, now, um, longer term strategy. I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I beg to differ. Um, there are longer term strategies. There is a very important one currently under elaboration. The EU global strategy uh, launched um, by uh, the new high representative vice president Federica Mogherini. Um, <coughs> Uh, right from the very start of her mandate, with a first report um, in our usual, um, maybe somewhat plodding uh, fashion, but we are a bureaucracy and we're proud of it, um, an analysis of the situation that Europe finds itself is in vis-a-vis -vis the world, the neighborhood and the broader global context. That was presented last spring it was looked at by the European Council. They said, fine, we broadly agree, uh, get on with it. Now, Mrs. Mogherini um, is working on turning that into a strategy, a global strategy, and I think it's important to emphasize the word global. I'll come back to it in a second. But this is being done in an iterative process, working with member states, with parliament, with think tanks, with outreach, trying to get people to comment, to provoke ideas that can be integrated into it. Um, that will then be presented uh, next spring 
uh, to um, be hopefully endorsed by uh, the member states in the European Council. Now, I said I was going to come back to global. The risk is if you make a global strategy that you make a global Christmas tree. You have a bit of neighborhood, you have um, some Chinese stars, you put a little bit of Latin American flavor, you have a whiff of Africa and this and that and the other. Um, that won't do. My own take on it is that the challenge, and that, Pascal, will come back to your question. The challenge is um, we haven't made the proper use of the Lisbon Treaty. That creates a new framework. It confers some more powers. What we should do is look globally at the possibilities we have under our own, under our own framework and then say, what can we use this for? in our different areas of interest. So it's global in the sense of our competences, global in the sense of our activities, rather than trying to please everyone around the world by remembering them in a paper. Um, that will translate into medium or short-term action, because that's what you have a, a long-term strategy for. Um, we, you, of course, you have to act or react to situations. You can plan, uh, you can try to prepare. Uh, if the longer you plan, the more likely you are to get it wrong. So you have to be flexible and react to situations. Um, you say you've been following the refugee crisis for the last four weeks. Um, I've been following the migrant issues for the last 10 years. Did I get it right all the time? Of course I didn't. But this is not new, and we're not reacting to it now. We're adapting our policies to a totally new situation. There are all sorts of reasons why it's totally new. Should we use that as an illustration to say, forget about the rest of the world and let's concentrate on the neighborhood? No. Um, one very stark illustration of this. You look at the people who are currently coming in through uh, what I might call the Eastern Mediterranean, Western Balkans route. Currently the main route for migrants arriving in Europe. The largest group by far are Syrians, about a third of them. The second largest group are Afghans, 20%. So Syrians and Afghans together, 50%. If we close ourselves down and say, forget about the rest of the world, we just look at the neighborhood. What kind of message does that send to Afghanistan? What kind of message does it send about our possibilities to have the slightest bit of influence there? I think, I mean, uh, with all due respect, um, we are in a situation where Europe, because of its sheer size and its weight, not so much demographically as economically and in certain other dimensions as well, no action is as much of a policy choice as action. We don't have the luxury of a small state that can say we choose and we select and we deselect. We can't do that. Therefore, we have to see how we can prioritize within the means we have and use them in different ways um, around the world. Uh, there was someone here who said that Europe is all about doing business and not about projecting values, contrary to the US and China. I thought that was a very original comment. Um, I usually get criticized for projecting too much values and uh, not looking after business enough. Um, and I'm not really aware of um, a, a, a big raging debate on Chinese values being projected across Africa or elsewhere. So I think I just leave it uh, at that. Um, and I, I'm conscious of time, so um, trying, trying uh, to, to wrap up. Um, on the civil society point, what happened in Bonn yesterday, I have no clue. I'm not being informed about it, so I won't comment on it. Uh, standing up for civil society is somewhat of an almost unique European um, sort of uh, sports discipline if you compare to other main actors. Uh, there are very few others who bother very much about it. Sadly, very few of our partners around the world. There are some outstanding examples of those who do. Generally, our feeling is they do a lot better for it. Um, the um, comment or the question uh, from Pascal, if I leave things aside and say, what, what would I like? 
two things, um, and I've mentioned several of them already. Uh, one is uh, get our member states to live up to the Lisbon aspirations. Um, they seem to have woken up the day after signing the treaty and say, we didn't really do that, did we? Uh, and backtracking ever since. This is, I mean, this has happened every time we've done a new treaty. You will remember it from the, the, the Maastricht days. But I would have hoped that, well, what are we now, eight years, seven, eight years after um, Lisbon, that we would have come over that and that the hangover would be passed and we'd get on with actually living up to the potential of the treaty, living up to what we've signed up to. And in that sense also, yes, maintain our values. Thank you. You will have to answer on the consistency question in the next round, uh, because I think that a lot of people mentioned and shouldn't go under the table. I have, uh, I start again on the left, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Anna Diamandopoulou yeah. from uh, Friends of Europe, Greece. Um, speaking about the uh, Europe's global influence, we have uh, debated on uh, a list of issues, openness, competitiveness, trade, uh, military action, uh, and uh, of course the change of uh, the model of global governance and the participation of EU in a new way. I would like to ask you if you believe that uh, the universities issue plays an important role in uh, the uh, global uh, in the issue of global influence. For the time being, there is one million, uh, one point two million uh, Chinese students in uh, in the United States. There is a, an increasing uh, number of Russian students in uh, the U in the U.S. universities, USA universities. And there is a particular policy on Africa students. So this is not the case in the, uh, in the European universities. And uh, I'm wondering if there can be a long-term uh, uh, strategy for influence without the participation of universities in the other places of the world and the attraction of the students of the other places of the world. Okay, thank you. One question at this table, please. Yes. <coughs> Joachim Bitterlich, trustee, Friends of Europe. Mrs. Ambassador, I'm feeling as frustrated as you this morning, but not only this morning. We have been trying in vain since 40 years to develop a common foreign and security policy. Where are we? Well, the class is not yet half full, half full even. There are some attempts, yes, but in fact, there is nothing. I've I'm frustrated by the neighborhood policy. There is a need of a reset. I mention only one case, Tunisia. If we don't go there and help there now, please, this country could fall again. Please. And development policy, strange, strange enough. Don't we need a radical change where commission and member states are joining forces? We are living in the age of a self-assertion of Europe. And isn't it time to wake up? Thank you, Mrs. Ambassador. Thank you. You on the right side, lady with the Apple computer. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Clementine Forissi, I'm, I'm a French journalist working for Context.com. I wanted to ask you a question, and finally, I, I don't know if my question is accurate. When you think about the TTIP and the way the European Union is negotiating and how the member states are uh, saying all the time that we need to conclude this treaty as fast as possible, I'm, I'm thinking, well, how can you manage to gain from a negotiation if you always say that you want to conclude as fast as possible? But in a way, when you know how the European Union is working, um, and you know that it's not one entity but 28 member states, maybe it's impossible to say anything else that we need to conclude this negotiation because it's a kind of message that the EU sent to, her, to itself. What do you think about that? I have one uh, final in the very back, yes. Thank you very much. I can stand up if you like, yeah. I'm Luke Buss with ICN here in Brussels, um, and I was looking at the, the subtitles in the, uh, for this debate, and kind of climate change and sustainable development still kind of treated a bit in the margins, even to a point where 
some people say that it's not important for Europe to deal with because it's not where we have a big win. Yes, there is a lot of waste of time in the negotiations. I would agree. I've been there, and I'm luckily not anymore. But there's a lot of going in circles, hopefully with some result in Paris. But it's about the opportunity for Europe itself and to invest in this new economy. And there's a lot of business that is resentment, has some resentment there. There's a lot of new business coming on, on the, in the game. And, and they want Europe to act, and just in its self-interest even. Regardless of that, we only have 15% of these emissions globally. Yes, you could argue if we do a little bit less, it will make the big difference and, change, and save the world. If you look at the calculations, yes, you're right. But it's a global responsibility as well. And there is a lot of consumption happening here where you had uh, your production elsewhere. So we have an incredible responsibility on our consumption as well. And then lastly, if you want to keep your leadership, you have to see where the responsibility is and you will have to up your cards in the context of finance and climate change. You cannot utter it, otherwise you will not be credible. This is the only way to lead if you're credible. Thank you. One here. Yes. Yes, thank you. My name is Stephen Tebby. I'm the president of CDP Europe. We represent uh, uh, institutional investors globally with 95 trillion US dollars, assets under management, to get uh, companies, mainly listed companies, to disclose information on the environment. Now, it's a very interesting time when institutional investors and central bankers start getting worried about the environment. Like the governor of the Bank of England recently said, Mark Carney, if we want to stay within the two degree limits, then most companies have stranded assets. That makes investors quite nervous. So the problem is, though, easier said than done. As Peter Drucker said, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure. Now, therefore, maybe a, a, a little suggestion or an idea. Maybe it's time to think about a credit rating agency for the environment, an environmental or non-financial rating agency. And maybe since the two other big data uh, dominance uh, are already dominated by, by the U.S., if you think about financial data, Moody's, Standard Poor's, and Fitch, they have 95% of the market on financial data. Personal data, as we all know, is also pretty much dominated by the U.S. Maybe this is something that Europe could lead on. But make no mistake, it will be, and I'm particularly curious on Pascal Lamy's comment, um, view on this, it will be a feature similar to Airbus and Boeing at the time. We created Airbus to relativize the dominance of Boeing at the time. It needed very strong political leadership. And maybe this is something that Europe could lead and pick up on. And we're there to help, if you like. Thank you. One last question on this side. Uh, hi. Um, I suppose going back to the, the title of the debate, Recovering Our Influence, I, I think, first of all, we've got to start to look internally, to look at why we have an influence, because we have our values, because we have worked in a certain way, because we have managed to, to work through huge obstacles over many years to get to a point which isn't perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than what we started with. And just in the last number of years, during the course of the, the economic crisis and the austerity that came from it, we see how a lot of that has been dismantled or started to be dismantled. We see where one in four people in Europe now are living in material deprivation. We see where inequality is, is moving in a, in a very difficult direction. And I think in order for us to, to really have that level of authority, we have to start internally. And if we look at the SDGs, as was mentioned, there's a real blueprint there for how um, Europe can, can look to change itself in order to have that influence. And then when you look externally then, I mean, to build on that, if you want to call moral authority, which is probably a bit rich, we, we, let's not go there, that far, but let's say that we, we, we do have, you know, we have built up this experience, we have built up um, a place where people do want to come and there's a reason for that. Um, and let's, let's work to that. Um, as for, you know, somebody mentioned that development doesn't work, uh, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to disagree with that. In the last 15 years, global poverty has been reduced by 50%. In the next 15 years, it is really possible to eliminate it entirely. That's a vision that we all should have, and it's in all of our collective interests. Um, so uh, on, on, the, on climate, clearly, Europe has an important part to play in that, and we can do that. And I suppose we have to avoid the temptation when we're involved in, in global negotiation 
not to be part of a race to the bottom, but can try to influence others to come to where we're at. So a lot of difficult questions again. <laughs> um, and I know there's one for Pascal Lamy. He will answer it. Um, but maybe who wants to go first? Monsieur Clamadieu? No, just, uh, just a few words uh, on the two... Uh, to intervention on, uh, on climate change, the second one was broader. Yes, I do believe this is self-serving for Europe. I think uh, Europe will represent uh, in 2000, in 2030, 9% of the global uh, uh, CO2 emission. So it's not anymore our contribution which is key. Uh, but we have developed technologies uh, which should help us participate in the solution uh, of, this, uh, of these challenges and uh, I, I do believe that we need to be at the table, we need to be at the table to negotiate, make sure that we create a momentum for convergence between large economies and at the end of the day I hope that European industry will be there to provide part of a solution. Uh, on your comment on um, an environmental rating agencies to, to try to summarize, this is really the way we should be going. Uh, and not just the agency, creating the framework which allow us to measure how companies perform in terms of sustainable development. You've, do, you've been doing a very good job with the uh, carbon disclosure project, but we are still in a situation where there's plenty of different referentials, plenty of different framework, and it's, it's very complex for companies to understand how they can make the disclosures which are necessary. And, I was mentioning a few minutes ago that uh, I see a lot of initiatives within member states. I would feel much more comfortable if at the European level we are starting to tackle this and moving in the direction of setting some type of standards in terms of disclosure. And then once you have the standards, there's clearly a role for uh, organizations, call them rating agencies or others, to measure how company perform. And I'm a strong believer in the fact that um, the soft law which requires disclosure is in some cases a much stronger instrument than setting rules and regulation. Once companies have to disclose what they do in a certain number of fields, it creates pressure, it creates the mechanism to, uh, to improve. So uh, it's really an area where I think Europe should take the lead and it's, uh, it's not yet the case. Yes, CDP, that was the project, Carbon Disclosure Project, because you presented us just as CDP for those who... <laughs> well, just a very, very quick response. First of all, to say that we are very watchful of the way that uh, Europe is going to overcome and hopefully successfully the migrants' crisis, because this is a real test for all its ability, its will, and so forth, you know, to tackle such a complex issue. Uh, the other thing is that we are very much looking to the innovative approaches and new tools to address the problems that we are facing. And hopefully they will be strong enough to address the magnitude of the challenges that the Mediterranean is facing. On, on this data issue, and I would be very interested in uh, Christian Leffler's reaction on that. Uh, first, it is a huge issue about the external policy of the European Union. Given the importance of data, big data, data mining, uh, the economic value of that is increasing full speed and the political sensitivity in terms of data privacy protection is, uh, is there. And we know that we have this you have this issue on your hands, not only the Commission, since the Court of Justice uh, just killed uh, this uh, strange plumbery uh, which was called the safe harbor, uh, which was meant to provide some sort of crazy bridge between uh, the US uh, way of, private, of protecting data privacy and the EU way of protecting data privacy, which are totally different. And I very much agree with, with the sort of suggestion that on their, on their side, the Europeans should localize data in Europe. So one issue is localization, one issue is access. And we should distinguish between these two things. Localization is an economic issue. Access is both an economic and a political issue. But the notion that we should build our own 
data system, given the economic value of that, I think I, I would very much agree on that. There probably are market players in Europe that could do that. And if not, you know, Europe spent a lot of money in Galileo, for instance. Uh, spending a, a bit of money on data wouldn't, in my view, be absurd. But, of course, subject to the view of the Commission. Um, all right, just a, a few quick comments. Um, education at different levels, including university exchanges, um, yes, obviously important. I'm not going to get into the numbers game. There are a lot of foreign students coming to Europe as well, increasing numbers. Um, I've heard concerns expressed by some of my American friends and colleagues that they've had dropping numbers because of visa problems. Students that find it too difficult to get in. Um, in that context, I think uh, I would also want to highlight the EU, um, um, what they've changed the name for it now, Horizon 2020, the new research framework program. This is the biggest framework program in financial terms for research anywhere in the world, bigger than any of the American programs, and it's open to the world. Basically, all our partners around the world have the possibility to participate in research programs, in research consortia, financed by the EU, co-financed in some cases by our partners. The weak partners that don't have sufficient funding themselves can get that part paid by the EU as well. That's a very important way of building bridges and connecting people um, at a societal level rather than at the official level. Um, the CFSP glass half full or half empty, well, I think I will probably never satisfy you, so I, when we haven't got the time either to go through a long discussion here. Um, people seem to be changing the glass, uh, which is great, because it means that expectations are rising. If they're rising, maybe we're actually doing something right. So there is a hope that we can continue to do more. Um, and I do believe that uh, quite a lot has been achieved. We always want more, uh, but there's quite a lot going on out there. On neighborhood policy, and we haven't got the time to develop it much further, um, sometimes uh, when I hear um, the criticism that it's too much one size fits all, which I, as a concept I agree, that's the wrong way to go, but that we have to show greater understanding and flexibility for individual situations, that's usually code language for saying, don't ask us so much, just give us. Give us market access, give us funding, but don't ask us so much. Well, I'm afraid, no, if it's a partnership, we do ask. And we will continue to ask, because otherwise it's not a partnership. Uh, and we truly believe it should be. Um, the, the, on the development front for the EU and member states to join forces, yeah, great, tell the member states. Um, it's, I mean, it's too much part of national foreign policy. What we are doing, is creating stronger common frameworks, is doing much more common programming in a number of countries, which is beginning to give a result of better coherence and consistency at that level uh, in our efforts in different parts of the world. Um, on um, TTIP, I fully agree and I've, um, I'm a fervent believer of a good deal, not an early deal. If it needs a bit more time, give it a bit more time. That goes for most negotiations. Sometimes you really are up against the clock. Most of the time, you're not. Um, and in a union of 28, even if there are a few leaders who feel they're up against the clock because they happen to have elections, there will usually be 25 who don't have elections. Um, and we have to look after everyone. Um, the, the, on, on, on climate change, ratings, all that, um, maybe just to highlight another for example, we talked about the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda um, and how this agenda applies to everyone around the world. Now, the next step in the UN process is developing the indicators for how the agenda is accomplished. Uh, the first steps in backtracking we've already seen in people trying to turn that into a political negotiated process. Therefore, what is the EU doing? We're giving all the support we possibly can, including financial support, to um, a, a set of UN statistici statisticians 
to allow them to work independently to set out a whole series of indicators. If one can do the same thing on climate change, why not? I, fir I firmly believe that uh, EU is on the right track on climate change in the sense of investing politically and economically in it. I think it's good for our economy long term. I think that it's actually helped improve competitiveness of European industry, existing industry, and created new um, business um, sort of, um, possibilities uh, that are good overall for Europe. Plus, it's inherent in climate change. If we believe that that is a risk and a challenge, um, it's global. And we have to work on it. We have to work on it here. We have to work on it with our partners. We have to contribute to the Global Climate Fund because it is in our interest. We're not doing this out of some sense of altruism. We're doing it to preserve our own uh, environment. Last point, data exchanges, data protection. Yes, that is a hugely important issue. Um, one where we have a lot of work still to do internally, one where we also have to work externally with our partners, not least the United States. In today's world, virtually all economic activity, all economic interaction involves data exchanges. We will not be able to get the full benefits of a TTIP deal, if you believe that it's beneficial, uh, if we don't accompany that with a solid framework for data exchange. Otherwise, it just won't work. We have a fundamental, if you like, almost philosophical difference. I remember discussing this with the, the Deputy Homeland Secretary in the US um, um, a, a while ago, where uh, she said that um, in Europe, you are ready to share data with the authorities, healthcare, taxes, whatever but you are fiercely protective of them in a commercial context. In the US, it's the other way around. We do everything we can not to share data with the government. But when I buy a book from Amazon, I assume that they will share my data with Google, with somebody else as well. So we come to it from totally different angles, uh, and we're going to have to find um, an appropriate balance which is respectful of our fundamental belief in the protection of the integrity of the individual. The best step towards that is also um, that our agencies, their agencies, everybody's agencies, stop snooping at us. That makes the real discussion of finding a framework that can deal with legitimate data exchange more difficult if there is also a lot of illegitimate data mining. Thank you. I think you brought at the end um, the question of values back in, in terms of one actor that we haven't talked about today, which is the European Court of Justice, which is maybe the strongest defender of our internal values and where I think we probably um, are all happy that we have that institution defending these values. And if, about the consistency question, I think we're all aware that the current crisis risks undermining our credibility if we don't find common answers that are based on human rights and human treatment of everybody who comes. And I think that's a big challenge. We have touched sometimes, but um, we will probably all have to address jointly and not just uh, on national level and the European level and with the region. I think it's time for lunch. We don't want to stop you from getting your deserved lunch. I thank you all for having participated. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very much.